Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Madam Ansa. I'm the creator of the world, Spirit Tarot, and your hostess for uh, this evening's tarot sessions. I am an entertainer, event producer, and a community organizer living in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I do a lot of things. One of those things is share information about tarot. If this is your first time uh, watching, uh, we also have a plethora of recorded videos out on the YouTubes to get you more and different information. Uh, my classes are all level and by donation, pay what you can, uh, given that we are living in a time of epic social change and uh, fiscal uncertainty. You can pay if you're able uh, through Venmo or PayPal uh, if you can, and if you cannot, then please enjoy the class. Uh, you can learn more about my work at my snazzy evolving website, theworldspirittarot.com. But today, we're going to be doing two different sessions. We'll be walking through uh, two of the minor suits in the first hour, and then we'll be working on some spreads in the second hour that I just am very excited to share with you. At the moment, uh, while I'm talking, you may want to open up your notebook if you're a note-taking person and your uh, deck if you're a deck-having person. Uh, today, we're going to do a bit of a speed date with the Wands cards and the Cups cards. We're going to go through them on a tear. <laughs> so get those out for yourself. As you may know, the tarot has two families of cards. There are the major cards and the minor cards, the major cards. Uh, the major arcana. Arcana, of course, means secret. The major arcana, those cards essentially speak to the big arcs and the lessons of our lives, and the minors are more and more about dealing with the day-to-day -day human experience. So we are going to be working today on the, some of those minors cards. We're going to move rather quickly through the wands and the cups. Uh, that is 24 cards to examine in less than an hour. Uh, so I will move quickly. Um, but feel free, if you have any questions, to put them up in the chat, and my lovely controller in the control room there will let me know what, uh, what you wanted to share with me, if you had any questions. So, uh, I will be working and sharing with you the imagery of uh, the Rider Waite Smith deck, best known deck of this century, and my own deck. You may have other decks in front of you. Most of the time, the cards, the meanings, uh, the nomenclature, the numerals, most of the times those things are going to line up. Uh, that is in part because tarot is a tradition uh, with a lot of legs, a lot of continuity, uh, and also because many decks of this century are based on the writer Wade Smith. So most things, including my work, are going to resonate with hers, but whatever deck you've got, make a note of the places where they are similar and perhaps <clears throat> where they are different. We are going to start, uh, as is traditional, with the wands cards. Wands are the suit that typically in readings refers to the classical element of fire, passion, ambition, drive, leadership, and as my notes say, thrust. They're very much about uh, the driving impetus to get things done. Uh, some say that is that it is the suit uh, of the magician, uh, it is the suit of willpower, manifestation, and uh, generally the, the getter doneness. Uh, after that, we will move to cups. Cups are water and are uh, most commonly um, construed as the suit of relationships, emotions, feelings, inspiration, connectivity, and flow. So, now grabbing our wands, let us start at the ace. Here we see Pamela Coleman Smith's version. I'll try to avoid the glare for you. And uh, also, if you have a Rider Waite Smith deck uh, with this distinctive artwork, you may notice the color jobs are uh, entirely different from one deck to the other. Uh, the notation that we have in Pamela Coleman Smith's own hand about these illustrations were that they would be, uh, she was not in control of the color job and that she thought the coloring would be done rather hastily uh, and inconsistently throughout the deck. She had very little time actually to produce this monumental piece of work. So if you have an Ace of Wands and you're looking at it right now wondering why your sky is not orange, some printer somewhere thought that whatever you're looking at was the best choice. Uh, it is interesting and instructive uh, to see if you have multiple versions of this deck, how the different color jobs, how the different coloration from deck to deck uh, will inform the mood of your readings. So here we see in the in her tradition, you see the uh, very Monty Python-esque hand, <laughs> I think, <laughs> reaching out and holding the uh, symbol of the suit. 
here's my version. Very similar, uh, but perhaps a little less Monty Python, a little more Vesica Pisces. For me, uh, the imagery of this card, I wanted that sense of this as a seed. Uh, all the aces are gateways. They are all cards that describe you stepping into a new phase or a new chapter of adventure. And I wanted to illustrate that concept of the gateway by using the Vesca Pisces, traditional symbol of the goddess. And of course, it uh, is a visual cognate, if that's the word. Uh, it resonates uh, as the vulva. So that is a gateway that many of us have gone through. <laughs> uh, but so this card, when it comes up, uh, again, you know, the wands in general represent all of this uh, passion, fire, drive, creativity. Sometimes when this card comes up, uh, it will refer to a physical affair, like lustiness. Uh, sometimes it will also refer to the actual generative principle. So if this card comes up in a reading and there's any question about uh, babies in the situation, it's, it's good to look, see if there's any other signifiers suggesting fertility uh, is at work. But again, fertility, abundance, creativity can mean lots of things. It's not always uh, literally regenerative. Um, they, uh, the aces really describe everything that is sort of best in the suit. So in this case, um, your life blossoms with burgeoning creativity, new projects, and a renewed capacity to overcome obstacles to that accomplishment. This card says you're going to get it done. Now we're going to move to the two. Two is, uh, as we have uh, mentioned in previous uh, discussions, two is in general a talk about stepping out, uh, out of that, through the gateway, out of raw potential into initial manifestation. It is about learning how things work. It is about baby steps. So uh, the two of wands is a card that is often referred to as initiative. Oops, and that is not it at all. Where's my two? It got away from me. No, oh, here it is. Yes, so uh, here we see our figure standing looking out uh, over the harbor. They've got a few, uh, few staves around them and you will see uh, there are ships on the horizon. So uh, this card is initiative. You are poised to begin something new. Uh, there's a torch in each hand in my version Boop. to lead the way. I wanted to make this a little bit more of an oceanic culture kind of setting. Uh, this card suggests that you are doing the due diligence is always how I think of it, like figuring out what you need to do. What permits did you need to open that studio? What software do you need to open that business? Uh, what goals and parameters and accountability might you want to set for yourself if you are beginning a new project or set on personal change? Act smarter not harder. <laughs> so doing, taking time to do that due diligence, uh, making careful observation of the forces at play. Preparing before you take any kind of definitive action can help ensure your success. So in this version, we also see uh, there's some, there's that oceanic quality. Again, I really wanted to set this card um, outside the European context. So we have moved through initiative into ambition. Uh, Rachel Pollack, uh, eminent tarot scholar and mystic, uh, refers to this as a gateway card. Here we see that figure. They have probably sent their ships out uh, in good faith, hoping that they can make something wonderful happen. And uh, in my version, you can see that the ships have clearly begun to come back in. So that gateway that Rachel refers to is um, visually referred to here by having uh, that cross piece. Uh, that the person is leaping about, waving rather like an enthusiastic sand person. They've got a big full satchel next to them uh, to suggest uh, abundance and uh, speedy correspondence happening here. So uh, ambition here, your initial efforts are already paying off. Your ship is coming in. Your inter undertakings may be new, but the future prospects are also good so long as you continue to strive with an eye to the big picture. Fresh ideas, hard work, and dynamic action can continue to yield satisfying results in this card. This is a great card to get. <laughs> uh, both of those really speak to the raw potential of the suit of wands. Again, drive, willpower. It's the difference between having a neat idea and doing the work to make things come true. Now fours, as we have a uh, previously discussed. Uh, the fours in general are stable like a table. They sort of, 
they speak to a plateau. So when you are pulling cards, if you get a lot of fours, it suggests that everything has kind of reached a, not a final place, but a, but a, a moment of plateau. It's a good, a respite, a chance to catch your breath. So here uh, in the wands, uh, four is celebration. I always think of this very much as a sort of a Beltane kind of feel. The people are turning out, there's greenery, there's poles and flowers and people have wreaths in their hair. A feeling of festivity surrounds your work at this time. So this is a celebration. When this card comes up, it means that those initial levels of investment are paying off, everything is going great, and your community wants to come together with you and celebrate. Once again, here's my version, a little more explicitly Beltaney, but again, it's all about the community coming together and celebration. You've done so much, it's going so well, communion and a bit of a social release may be in order, abundance, openness, do not postpone joy, but nurture it now and lean into your optimism about the future. This great card. Sometimes it actually comes up for uh, hand fasting, marriagey, that type of stuff. Uh, but it can certainly come up for uh, uh, a less romantic um, and still very vital community sort of function. Uh, incidentally, uh, Llewellyn many years ago released a book. They a series of books on the uh, you know sort of classic pagan holidays of the Wheel of the Year, and they had me do an illustration for the Beltane book uh, because they liked this particular piece of art. So somewhere I have another version of this that is out there in the ether. So having gone through celebration uh, and that plateau that is the fours, we come to the fives. The fives are, <clears throat> uh, in general, they are cards of chaos. They suggest uh, colliding with conflict and uh, becoming wise to the world the hard way. So this card, uh, is sometimes known as conflict. Here's Pamela Coleman Smith's version. It's a bunch of people beating each other about with sticks. <laughs> um, this card describes competition in its many aspects, uh, and I find that when this card comes up, it asks you to beware of your motivation. Uh, at best, competition encourages you to excel at its worst. It tempts you to destroy yourself and others with hurtful comparison, gratuitous conflict, and uh, unbidden attack. So know yourself and your limits. Consider what your motivations really are. Here is my version. This version is a representation of Brazilian makulele, which is a stylized uh, martial art um, where you fight with sticks or uh, rhythmically you fight with sticks or with uh, machetes. And uh, so again, makulele is modeled on, it's like a like a martial arts kata, it's a way to practice technique, but it is performed primarily as a folk dance. So again, I thought that was a nice metaphor for this notion of are we fighting or are we just practicing excellence? Are we just pushing ourselves to excel? So conflict. Then we come to six. This is another glorious card in the wands. I would say the timber of the wands as a suit overall, pretty positive. So here we see the crown of laurels, they're clearly in some procession, everything is wonderful. This card is sometimes known as glory. This again is about being recognized uh, for your accomplishments. It seems to me that in the Four of Wands, it's more about coming together as a community. This is really sort of personal. All eyes are on you for what you have done. So this card augurs uh, good tidings, personal celebrity, community appreciation of your abilities, be mindful of leveraging your renown, achieve your goals, but be your best. <laughs> uh, as Rachel Pollack says, optimism produces the very success it desires and expects. Here's my version. It's very similar. Here comes the person through, uh, the, through the townsfolk. Everyone's turned out very celebratory. Uh, in this case, there's a sense of bringing down your heart learned wisdom from the mountain. Glory. There's literally glory rays in this one. Ah. <laughs> and then we come to the sevens. Uh, students of mine will remember perhaps that the sevens, uh, if the fives are chaos and the six is knowledge, uh, it is, they are, in, they are intelligence combined with wisdom <laughs> because you have learned something difficult in the course of the, uh, of the fives. Now in the seven, we know enough to ask deep questions about the nature of things. So the seven of wands uh, is sometimes known as courage. 
You have the experience to know what's worth fighting for in this world. Define the shape of your life by putting your convictions in motion. Do not let others distract or dissuade you. I always think of this as the card of the activist. This is the part where you say, I know exactly what I can and cannot abide. In my mind, I always hear Jean-Luc Picard say, the line must be drawn here. So here we see this person. This person, as compared to uh, Pixie Smith's illustration, it's a little bit less explicitly martial. This person is prepared for the worst, but they are not currently uh, in fighting. Yet they are saying, I am prepared to do whatever it takes in order to make the world the way I need it to be, defend my people, my values, and such. Coming through those sevens, the vortex cards, we now find ourselves in uh, the eights. Eights are a double stable table. They seem to me, again, as a, as a chance to uh, sort of re-arrive in certainty and knowledge. This card very simply just says, vitesse, things are happening fast. <laughs> uh, in, uh, in my book, I think we refer to this one as opportunities. Uh, but it also is called incoming, like everything is moving really fast. Uh, expect lots of rapid change after experiencing a period of stagnation. New influences may be blazing through your life like arrows on fire. Uh, they used to say um, a message by the post, you know, an incoming message back when things weren't instantaneous. <laughs> so now it could be messages in any form. Uh, visitors, sudden serendipity, that incoming energy may be... Uh, welcome but is definitely surprising so be prepared to be agile i just same image i stuck with her eternal illustration wisdom but just added fire what would it be the suit wands so now we find ourselves coming uh later in our cycle of the wands in the nines we begin to see what I would say, I think of the nines as like the pinnacle of the suit before it almost gets to be too much for itself. Like this is the suit in its most, uh, in this case, in its most inflamed form, I would say, given that it's, you know, the suit of fire. This is the card of defensiveness. So here we see a person, they appear to have beaten a bit about head, the head and shoulders, like here's the bandaged person, uh, perhaps on watch. Years of endurance may have primed you to meet uh, difficulties head on and to win, but this card is about, to me, it can be about PTSD. It can be about not knowing when to stand down, when to release uh, some of that, your defensive nature. So it can be hypervigilance, uh, paranoia, chronic stress. Consider evaluating what's appropriate and perhaps dialing back your response to something less exhausting, perhaps something more sustainable. Because remember, if you haven't got your health, you haven't got anything. <laughs> so there's my version. Sometimes, again, in whatever deck you're working with, uh, often the art does not stray very far from the good work that Pamela Coleman Smith did because, she, again, her work was so iconic. Uh, often the only real changes that I made, other than, you know, just changing up the atmosphere, is to make it more inclusive, different body types, different... Um, sort of uh, referred geographies and ethnic groups and so forth, because the, the kernel of that, what could be better than a person clearly on watch to describe this principle of defensiveness? And now we come to the 10. Uh, this is sometimes called burdens. I just think of it as burnout. Here's the traditional image of a person clearly doing too much. <laughs> Beware burnout, though you may be very capable, you cannot take on any more commitments. Why are you overburdened? You may just be in the habit of martyrdom, codependence, or not wanting to miss out on opportunities. Stop saying yes to everything. Just evaluate your obligations and uh, make the hard choices that may save your sanity, your relationships, ultimately your time and your health. Here's my version. This if this were a photo, this was taken just moments after this one. And here, the person is going, maybe I could do it, maybe I can do it. In this image, they clearly uh, have succumbed to overwhelmed and everything has begun to fall down around them. So, uh, and you will see in this image as well, clearly we are at either the close of day or the close of night. It is, uh, it is left deliberately ambiguous whether you are beginning a long dark night of, uh, being overwhelmed and having things fall down around your ears, or if you are mostly through that part and now you are standing on the 
ready to stand up because it's morning and time to uh, time to rebuild. Tens in general are about uh, too much of a good thing. <laughs> in this case, too much opportunity, perhaps. Uh, so this card says, beware the burnout. Yes. I'll, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the chat. And Kessinger says, I've had this car show up indicating my to-do list. Oh, yes. <laughs> that would entirely make sense. Uh, so Anne's message is that uh, this comes up for the to-do list. I would suggest that you may have too much on your plate. And if you are managing it gracefully now, you may want to set some parameters and not say yes to anything else. Uh, notice how many things, notice how many uh, sort of the, the combined burden of all of those obligations, all those places where you said yes, don't do more. Maybe you can keep it there. Maybe you don't need to do less, but I would not add one more thing lest you overbalance and find yourself uh, like this person cowering <laughs> under a pile of spilled kindling. It's a great card, very evocative. Now we get into the, uh, the next part, which is uh, the people cards or the court cards. They merit a whole class unto themselves. Uh, we did a bit of a special topic class on them last week. Uh, and so today we will touch on them. Each of the suits, wands, cups, uh, pentacles, and swords, each of those is comprised of ace through 10. We just walked through ace of 10 of the wands. And then we have uh, four, usually, sometimes three, but generally four court cards, face cards, people cards, noble cards. They go by different names, but essentially they are something like a younger person, a slightly older person, two fully mature people of varying genders and statuses. They may be kings and queens, they may be shamans and priestesses, depends on the deck. Uh, but they generally start out um, with something like a page or a princess, or in my case, in my deck, it's the seer. So let's take a minute to walk through these. When these uh, people cards come up in a reading, they, again, they merit a whole bit of research all on their own because they're so interesting. But they generally refer to a person in your, in the context of the life of the querent. <clears throat> so that may be, you know, a person in the office, a person in the family. Uh, they also frequently refer to an aspect of one's self. So there's a, there's a lot of material in here. I would say that when we're talking about the page, princess, seer, this sort of youthful personality, we are talking about, um, here is a person who embodies that drive, that ambition, that, that hunger to get things done. Uh, and they may have a lot, of, uh, a lot of talent, a lot of vitality, but not a lot of life experience. So they come up to describe somebody who's, you know, sort of at that place in their learning curve. You can see here, it's as if the page is going, golly, look at this wand. There's so much I could do with this. I, can, I begin to sense the potential of myself as a tool using biped. <laughs> Hungry for life experience, this personality is feisty, uh, but with sometimes a false sense of immunity to danger. At their most challenging, they can be blunt and impetuous because they don't really understand consequences. At their most compelling, they are very charismatic. They uh, have an adventurous spirit. Their restlessness can be disruptive to dogma, which is great, and brings a breeze of change to the world much needed at this time. But again, this personality often is not bringing a learned wisdom so much as the high fire of uh, their leonine drive and uh, desire and ideals. So be they page, princess, seer, or yet some other indicator, that always speaks to uh, that youthful aspect. Now, the person could be of any age, they could be of any gender, don't pay attention to all that other stuff. Um, it's really a question of what the qualities that the person brings to it. Now, most decks are going to bring us to something like uh, a knight or a prince, uh, something to that effect. In my deck, it is a seeker. Here's the Pamela Coleman Smith version. All of her knights are uh, feisty, youngish men on mighty steeds. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, in the Light and Shadow deck, which is a class that I'm very delighted to teach with sometime. Uh, all of those, uh, all of those knights and so forth have 
it doesn't just stop there. They have extraordinary beasts. Uh, the art is incredible. There's bison and eagles and all kinds of things. So if you're an animal person and you're really, uh, really moved by that symbolism, look up the Light and Shadow deck. I highly recommend it. So uh, you can also see here he's got uh, the uh, salamander, uh, an old symbol of the suit of fire. And uh, you can see his wand, it's not just a stick, but it really does have the sort of sprigs of vitality from it. So we see this, we see this guy. Uh, this card can be the card of a head turning flirt, well endowed with action hero charms. Uh, in this case, I drew him as very insouciant and like, yeah, I got it. Uh, this one will be redrawn in my, the next edition of my deck. However, this gentleman will be replaced with a super awesome Mongol. Do do do. So this personality uh, tends to be uh, a bit of a rover, has an aptitude for being in the right place at the right time. Charming, charismatic, but easily distracted. I would say that might be true of, of most of the seekers. They tend to be, uh, they're in it for the adventure, so they want to go or, where the adventures are. Uh, the seeker of wands can be uh, loyal to their friends, even if they're creative focus may shift as they sort of explore their place in the world. They aggressively initiate, but they rarely have the stamina to commit past the first thrill. They are in it to initiate, but again, this is a youthful expression of that sort of drive. I think of all of the knights as having a sort of a missionary zeal, you know, they have that, that quality. Teenager with a car, they don't know anything about the world, but they're teenagers with, teenagers with cars, and they're ready to go out of the driveway and find out the hard way what they don't know. <laughs> so there's that one, feisty. Uh, now we are coming down to the last few cards in the suits uh, of, uh, of wands and cups. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chatsy. We shall now talk about the queen. In most decks, the queen is called the queen. Uh, in my deck, she happens to be called the Sybil. I wanted to move away from the sort of aristocratic hierarchy that was built in the deck, but call it what you might, you still have uh, an empowered person, sovereign. <clears throat> so this, uh, oh, by the way, as I may have mentioned to you before, this little cat, it, it is a picture of a real cat that was in Pamela Coleman Smith's uh, environment, and that cat's name was Snuffles. <laughs> so as you look at the mystical beast that represents the queen, the paragon, the sovereign of fire, and Snuffles. An intense and passionate visionary, uh, the queen or the sibyl puts themselves heart and soul into their work. Uh, by a good example, the queen can inspire others to want to totally commit. She has all the follow through that the uh, feisty, less experienced seeker lax. This personality is loyal and protective, selflessly dedicated to hearth and tribe. They are fearless, they are willful, uh, they are ablaze with self-confidence. They tend to overcome their obstacles with great ease. Uh, they can be uh, intimidating to folks who are uh, easily cowed by the ambitious, particularly people who are afraid of powerful women. Here we see her again. She's still got her snuffles, but we have reset her in a bit more of a worldly warm environment. Yeah. Uh, when people cards come up in a reading, again, it tends to, the question, the first question that I ask myself as a reader is, is this a person in the reading? Is this a quality in the reading? You know, quality, uh, a quality of personality that my querent needs to embrace or needs to be mindful of. I will say, if you do a reading for somebody and a, there are a myriad of people cards come up, you know, there's uh, 16 in the deck. Uh, and if you get four of them, that tells you that whatever else is happening for yourself or your querent, whoever you're reading cards for, there are a lot of people uh, influencing their situation. At that point, it's pretty clear it's not just a matter of what's going on for them internally, but it's really all the different folks that are at work shaping their fates, shall we say. So there's our Sybil of Wands. And now we come to <clears throat> our king. Uh, in some decks, I believe he's also called the Knight, just to make it really confusing. And in my deck, it is the Sage. Alert. Feisty. He, while he is seated in this suit, 
Uh, he appears to be ready to spring out of his chair in order to bring his, you know, full concentration to everything. And then he has this adorable little lizardy jam down here. I'm not sure what kind of lizard it is. Very attentive. Also, this lizard looks like it's ready to jump off the wall. So he's a uh, he's very feisty. Here's my version. He is. While he's on a throne, he is in fact in motion. He is relentless in his trajectory. So with the sage, I say that he is ablaze with creative fervor and ambition. He is charismatic, willing and able to carry the day. He's a natural leader. This personality flourishes in action and stagnates uh, in quarantine, stagnates uh, when they are uh, forced to, uh, to be inactive. They thrive on strategy. Uh, they manage risk extremely well. Their willingness uh, to innovate engenders well-earned success because although they're brave and dashing, they're not scatterbrained. They tend to be uh, have well-learned wisdom, well-fought, well you might say. Uh, at worst, they can be a hot-headed authoritarian because that is a, that is a danger anytime you combine uh, charisma, uh, personal power and leadership. You know, there's always the fear of a despot uh, who can be stiflingly intolerant of anyone who challenges them. But at their best, uh, this is a very uh, powerful external application of that kind of drive. So that brings us through our king. How are we doing? Oh, I'm going to have to talk really fast to do the second suit, aren't I? <laughs> All right. So we're going to jump into the cups. Because I spoke so rapidly last week, I've been trying to pace myself, but now it's time to talk really fast. We're going to jump into the cups. That's fine. Emotions don't take a long time to talk about, right? That's easy. <laughs> Stop hitting the table. Mm. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so let us come now to uh, the cups. As mentioned previously, aces are all about some, uh, about the beginning, the initiation of things. So we see here, uh, if you had not noticed this with a Rider Waite deck, uh, Pamela Coleman Smith uh, converted to Catholicism shortly after making this deck, and this deck was commissioned by a mystic uh, Christian. So there's a lot of Christian symbolism in this deck, which makes it interesting to me how popular it is with uh, very unchristian witchy people. Of course, do whatever you like. I just think it's worthy to note there is no deck, there's no card in the deck that is more conspicuously Christian than this one. But for the purposes of the reader, be you Christian or be you not, this card comes up to say you are in the, um, it is a rebirth of tenderness, uh, emotional availability, intuition, dreams, everything about this card is juicy. Uh, it can be sexy. It is certainly tender. Everything about it is um, very sloshy and voluptuous. <laughs> The waters of the deep self well up here, making it possible to have renewed connection with other people. This card can come up when you're standing in the beginning of a new relationship uh, with others uh, or with self. Cups are like that. All right, so here, the two is the card of relation. Uh, this is about the fresh beginnings of relationship, again, with others as well as with yourself, rediscover your capacity for a healthy trust, cooperation, empathy. Empathy is very significant in this card. If you expect good things from others, and remember that honest love for other people requires some self acceptance, you may find gentleness and you may engender gentleness in others. Friendship and even romance can show up. With this card, it is similar to the uh, to the lovers card, just a little more, just a little more down to earth. Here's my version inside the fairy circle. This is the card of relation, and uh, reflective of that relationship that this card has with the lovers card. Uh, in my card, you will see both Quan and Panyin in those corners to represent passion and compassion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we come to the three of cups. The three of cups is friendship. If the other one is about relation uh, with other, this one is about relationship with community. When this card comes up, this is the traditional card of secret societies of women, by the way. Uh, it is time to uh, deepen and expand your sense of community. This card calls for you to break bread with those you care for, cultivate community based on shared values and social pleasures, find common ground with folks of all ages, 
that was important to me in making this card where I wanted to ensure that notion of mother maiden crone and community that is not just the folks that are most like you, but also folks that are different and bring different experience to that experience of friendship and the bread breaking. Then we come to four. As you recall, before, fours are kind of plateau. Now, in wands, which are about action and ambition, that provides us with a moment of respite. Strangely, in the cups, this is where we start to see cups, I don't want to say go wrong, but where things get a little bit uh, more challenging because cups are about flowing and reaction and response. And so when we have this four here, it actually manifests as a bit of stagnation, I would say. So this card is often known as apathy. Uh, it describes a sort of, a, it's like, you've had enough of being uh, sloshed on <laughs> by other people's emotional process, I would say. It can be a lonely time devoid of motivation and self-confidence. Uh, it can come up when your expectations and hopes for love and connection have been uh, failed somehow, uh, leaving you feeling as if nothing is worth doing. That discontent can leave you feeling cut off from your inspiration and your authenticity. Uh, but everything that you need to overcome your adversity is there, usable by you. You may need to take a moment, find yourself, reground, uh, rest up, and then rise up. We see here the magic chalice is there the whole time. Uh, this card is also sometimes called depression because it has that feeling of a unexpected heaviness upon you. Coming to fives, once again, fives are chaotic. This one is disappointment. Uh, we have moved from, I don't feel so good, to I'm downright heartbroken, rooted in regret of dashed hopes and misspent goodwill. Uh, angst and depression are appropriate when this card come up. You get to grieve your losses, but decide how long you want to stay there. Self-nurturance and recovery time are needed for sure when this card comes up. <laughs> Much milk remains unspilled that can be saved if you see there. Not all of those cups are overturned if you can pull yourself together in time. But notice this person is on the floor when this card comes up a lot of times. It's the kind of disappointment, the kind of grief where you, you ground yourself by literally falling to the floor. So this one describes some of the heavier aspects of Cup's life. <laughs> but now we come to the six. Uh, this card came up when I was working with a client today. It's such a great one. Sometimes known as daydreaming. Uh, I think of this card as, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's actually known as uh, Sanctuary. Sanctuary of the Familiar. So you, this is a great time to rejuvenate and reconnect with well-known places, things that nurture you. Find your happy place, be that activities like walking or journaling or yodeling, whatever it does it for you. Uh, or, you know, maybe you're one of those people who needs to get your hands in the dirt or needs to, you know, needs to hit the gym in order to feel better. Seek out opportunities to fully relax, uh, reconnect, and restore everything that is best in you. In this case, I made sure to set mine in the very same garden. Let's see if you can see that there. Boop. They're in the same location. <laughs> but this one has those really nice flat iron mountains from Boulder, Colorado <laughs> in the background. So then, moving from sanctuary, then we come to the card of daydreams. This one, <clears throat> there's been a lot of ink spilt trying to determine what exactly is going on with all of the visions that they see in the cups. Uh, to me, this card really means, it just asks you, are you daydreaming? Are you just being foolish? Uh, I think of this card as uh, advising you to flip the script. It's saying, consider the unimaginable possibility. What if you sold everything? What if you expatriated? What if you decided to dig in and become a mushroom farmer? I mean, whatever it is that is least likely for you, consider the unthinkable possibilities and a lot of interstitial possibilities uh, will well up in between. So uh, while unbridled fantasy can lead to a delusion and wasted resources, uh, innovation and self-reinvention can come out of letting yourself be playful in your mind. Know your most brilliant options and commit to do what best serves you and the world. <laughs> and dogs. This one is a picture of my dad, <laughs> who is definitely a dreamer. Now we come to the eight. Once again, stable. This Because here we are in the cups, this suit 
of, uh, of flow and um, sort of watery vibration, as it were. This one, <clears throat> I think of this uh, as the card of the vision quest. Here we see, it's like, things are stable. You've survived all that tumult. And the person goes, now I know enough to know what is missing in my life and to know what is worth seeking at any cost. So your true self awaits. A journey of self-discovery must be undertaken. Doing so may change your life, change your values, your very being. I've had this card come up for people who were considering, uh, you know, later in life, considering joining the ministry or giving themselves to magic or considering going off and trying ayahuasca for the first time. Uh, it's very much a card of realizing that there's a part of yourself that you can sense it like a phantom limb, but you cannot see it and you're on the quest to find it. As uh, Joseph Campbell said, the dark night of the soul comes just before the dawn. So in my image, again, there's some cups that you, you know, you can see, and yet there's also all this that is clearly sensed. And so the person has set off into the night on a journey to find all of those things about themselves. Uh, now we come to the nines and we are doing okay on time. <laughs> this card, uh, it's the bluebird of happiness card. <laughs> Here's a person looking very happy, sitting in front of all their goodies, very replete and comfortable. Uh, fortune smiles upon you uh, right now. This marks an auspicious time to invite every good thing into your life. There's literally the bluebird of happiness. <laughs> Cast your hopes wide and uh, be sure to invite in good things and share them, spread around uh, the romantic and filial fulfillment, financial safety, social harmony. This is like a card where you're, uh, you are so abundant that you can pay it forward. So love that card. Then we come to the 10. Once again, the 10 is like uh, the suit. <laughs> the 10 is the suit turned up to 11. So uh, the 10 in this case, emotional fulfillment. Here we see people dancing, uh, some sort of a family unit dancing under a rainbow. There's 10 cups in the sky. Everything seems very um, pastoral. Uh, there's a deep and lasting sense of belonging and security. Uh, this tends to speak to feeling connected and committed to your, uh, to your tribe, whether it's your family uh, or your chosen tribe. Uh, it is a card of celebration of hearth and home and all that is best in domestic life. Remember that not all of life happens out there. My card is very much in the same vein, but I wanted to uh, break up the sort of heteronormative imagery of it. This is deliberately ambivalent about what is the nature of this family unit or tribe that we're looking at here. There's kids, there's people of all ages and genders. Uh, you know, I wanted to decentralize the heterosexual experience in the expression of this as if the nuclear family is the only way to experience ultimate fulfillment. Let's not put that out there. So I like to think there's lots of ways that could happen. Now let's jump into those people cards. So we've got our, our page or our seer. Boop. Classic little fish coming up out of the cup. I mean, that's so darn Jungian. It's adorable. So the, the seer of cups in this context, uh, it is, um, a card of uh, dreamy idealism, sensitivity. I always think of this as the, like the singer songwriter secret journal, <laughs> spending a lot of time uh, with and exploring your feelings uh, as you become self-aware enough to uh, brave the world of other people. Life is both enriching and vulnerable when you're wearing your heart on your sleeve like this, uh, like the seer does. And that, that fish or that turtle, they are bringing information up from deep, uh, from your deep subconscious to help inform your uh, life in your deep and authentic feelings. Such a sweet card. And then we come to the seeker. Oops, that's not them. Boop, here we go. Uh, as we saw the sort of feisty night in the last set, this one looks much more placid. You're sort of moving forward very stately. The Seeker is an idealist, um, a dreamer, a visionary with talent and sensitivity. Uh, I always say that this card is Mr. Commitment Issues. Could be Ms. Commitment Issues. You can see they have eyes only for the cup. They think that they love you, but they might just be in love with the feeling of love. Uh, 
this is the patron saint of hookup culture at its best. So uh, if you don't take it personally, it could be a very good time. But I would not come at this personality with a lot of uh, deep and rooted expectations because that is not what the seeker is here to do. <laughs> uh, yes, Mr. To-Go Cup. <laughs> I love that. So just don't expect uh, follow through uh, on connections and promises. Just caught up in their brilliant fantasy. They just sometimes forget to participate in the real world. The time and adventure that you can experience with this person, be they as, you know, friend, lover, uh, you know, artist whose work you like to support. It could be all kinds of things, but uh, you just need to understand where they are at. They are questing in the realm of deep feeling. And now we come <clears throat> to the Queen of Cups. I love her too. Boop, there she is. She is a very complicated cup she's got there. It almost looks like the Ark of the Covenant. This card, she is a master of love with detachment. The Sybil offers you sound guidance without judgment. She can resist being drawn into your emotional drama while remaining sensitive, compassionate. She can go with the flow. She can heed her feelings. She can resist repression. Uh, she can model healthy boundaries for you. Uh, she can be insightful, creative, and uh, well-adjusted and still authentically be there for you. Uh, she really is the master of the element of emotion. And now we come to our last, again, this is the, this is the speed version. We could spend a whole day just talking about these guys. Here is our King of Cups. He is a, a little bit of a tortured soul. <clears throat> um, the thing about the Sage of Cups, he is the king, and uh, so he is seated on a throne. The very concept of a throne is something fixed, something solid, something masterful, uh, something static, and here he is trying to rule in a world that is entirely fluid. So um, I would say that this card can come up for folks who are, uh, it can be that they are uh, neuroatypical. It can be folks that struggle with really trying to be in the shared human experience of day to day and also kind of in their own world because they are really trying to function in two different modalities at the same time. Uh, this can very much be a card of mystics, artists. Um, at best, they can be great uh, diplomats because they are capable of finesse and they, they try to be dialed into how other people are feeling and responding. They can lead well in that capacity and they can also gaslight you brutally because uh, they, again, can sort of see, uh, they can be with their feelings and they can also see what makes other people's, uh, what flicks other people's switches. Uh, that, they have an empathetic personality. Uh, again, at its best, it can be wonderful and emotionally available and its worst, it can be very uh, challenging. <clears throat> so that is a quick walk through uh, all of our wands and all of our cups. The thing to look for in a reading, again, is if you see a great preponderance of wands in a reading, let's say you pulled eight cards for someone, uh, and there's a preponderance of wands that lets you know whatever the question was actually about, the question that is being answered is going to be about drive, passion, work, ambition, everything that is feisty and fiery. If they thought they were asking you a question that was based on swords and logic and you get all wands, you are uh, getting different information and you're going to need to find a diplomatic way to uh, guide yourself, your friends, your family, your queerance into that understanding. Likewise, if you get oodles of cups in a reading and you thought it was about pentacles and you were going to be doing a reading about, you know, jobs and job security and money in the bank and so forth, and all you're getting is cups, you know that you asked one question, but the answer you're getting is entirely uh, about how this situation is really being approached from a place of raw uh, emotional sensitivity. And those are uh, all useful, but a very different uh, answer than your parent may have been asking. <laughs> Uh, again, the aces always describe sort of a stepping off into a new, uh, a new window, a new doorway in life. And the tens usually describe a situation coming to some sort of a close. Uh, you are looking at moving out of that phase and into something fresh and new. If you have any other questions for me, I'll throw them in the chat right now. And otherwise, 
Uh, I thank you for your time today. I encourage you to uh, journal and work with the cards uh, vigorously uh, this week. Uh, next week we have our uh, Halloween sessions. We will do more with the minor cards in the first half and the second one we will do some Halloween specific uh, readings and techniques. Thank you so much.